Welcome to my video about secret ritual ingredients in ancient magic, what they are and what they were used for. Ancient magic played an important role in dealing with personal and professional challenges in antiquity. People who went to see a magician came from all walks of life. They shared the hope that magic would help them solve their problems, protect them from evil and dangers, and release them from their worries. Ancient magicians used to write down their rituals in scrolls and books, so-called ritual manuals, and they annotated the rituals and made notes about their efficacy. From the Greco-Roman period in Egypt, more than 100 of these manuals are known to us today, comprising over 600 individual ritual instructions. Some manuals include additional information, like lists of good and bad days for the performance of a ritual or separate invocations and prayers. In one of these manuals, a magician wrote down a mysterious list with 37 secret code words for ritual ingredients. He added that these code words were used by Egyptian priests for reasons of safety. But he didn't include any information about the purpose, efficacy or application of the ritual ingredients. This list and the journey to explore and unravel its secrets is what this video is about. The magical papyrus in which this mysterious list is preserved was found in Egypt. The exact find spot is unknown. It is dated between the 2nd and the 4th century CE and modern scholarship refers to it as PGM 12. PGM is the abbreviation for Papyri Greche Magike, which means Greek Magical Papyri in English. The rituals in this manual cover a wide range of purposes, including divination, love, separation, to release from curses, to protect against anger, and to gain favor in friends. Towards the end, between two unrelated ritual instructions, the author wrote down the list. It is introduced as Hermeneumata, translated from the holy, which the sacred scribes used. Hermeneumata means interpretations, and sacred scribe is an Egyptian priestly rank. There is no additional information given to holy, and scholars have reconstructed holy temples as well as holy books. Here are some examples from the list. To the left are the code words, and to the right the ritual ingredients. Blood of Hephaestus is wormwood. Semen of Helios, white hellebore. Blood of a snake, hematite. A bone of an ibis, buckthorn. A physician's bone, this is sandstone. The code words follow a regular pattern. They are either made of parts or of bodily secretions of deities, animals, or, to a much lesser extent, of humans. The ritual ingredients they encode are predominantly plant-based. The author provided some more information about the list. Here is my initial translation. Because of the interference of the many, they inscribed the herbs and that other which they had used on statues of the gods, so that they interfere with nothing, being incautious, because of the ongoing failures. But we fetched the solutions out of the many copies, together with all the encryptions. This short introduction offers a lot of information. We are dealing with a list of code words which were applied by Egyptian priests. These code words encrypt ritual ingredients used by those priests. The context of the code words is an Egyptian temple. The priests felt the need to encrypt their ritual ingredients because the many, likely referring to a larger number of non-experts, applied these ritual ingredients themselves, but in the wrong ways. And as a result, they failed and potentially caused harm. This implies that the many had access to information about ritual ingredients used in Egyptian temples. The author of the list managed to get access to copies in which the code words and their solutions were preserved. 
and he decided to include 37 of them into his own compilation of rituals, but without adding any information about their applications. When I read the introduction, I wondered, what kind of ritual ingredients could have caused so much harm that Egyptian priests felt the need to intervene by encrypting them? How could wormwood, dill and hematite be part of that? I was curious and wanted answers. In terms of modern scholarship, no in-depth research concerning the list has been done so far, and the few slightly more comprehensive studies turned out to be a dead end. They are based on the presumption that the introduction and the list should certainly not be taken at face value, and that the author didn't know what he was writing about. The extent to which some academics were willing to go to prove that the ancient magician was nothing but a clueless fraud whose sole aim was to attract customers only illustrates the short-sightedness of previous research, supporting the long-held prejudice against ancient magic. But it misses the chance to find answers and to improve our understanding of ancient beliefs and ritual practices. The first thing I then did was to look up the actual ritual ingredients in the list. I learned that some of the plants were poisonous, like the euphorbia and the white hellebore. This would explain, at least in part, the harm non-experts could have caused when applying them incorrectly and without caution. Next, I looked up if the code words and the ritual ingredients occur elsewhere in the Greco-Egyptian magical papyri. And yes, both do! Various ritual ingredients from the list occur especially in the more extensive manuals PGM 1, 3 and 4, and repeatedly in contexts of a burnt offering and divination. Some examples are buckthorn, wormwood, house league, bedellium. Bedellium is also written as bedella in the magical papyri. And hematite. Here is an example from a 4th century ritual instruction in PGM 4. The burnt offering which endows arrows, and the whole procedure with so. Mana, four drams. Storax, four drams. Opium, four drams. Myrrh, also four drams. Frankincense, saffron, and bedella, one half dram each. But not only the ritual ingredients are attested multiple times in other magical papyri. Some of the code words are as well. The semen of Helios, in Greek Heliogonos, is identified in the list in PGM 12 as white hellebore. Heliogonos occurs in PGM 3, line 333, together with the semen of Selene, called Selenogonos, as part of an offering in context of a divination. Semen of Helios also occurs in the Egyptian Magical Papyrus PDM 14, known as the London Leiden Magical Papyrus, in context of a list of herbs. Serpent's blood, identified in the list as hamatite, is mentioned together with a suit of a goldsmith in an ink recipe in PGM 4, lines 2004 to 2005. The contexts are the attraction of a serming diamond and divination. While it is possible that serpent's blood was actually meant here, grinded hematite is attested in ancient Egyptian inks which were used in ritual contexts, and thus serpent's blood, actually meaning hematite, cannot be ruled out. The blood of a cunocephalos, identified in the list as blood of a spotted gecko, is used in the 8th book of Moses, that is PGM 13, line 316 has additional ingredient in a myrrh ink recipe in context of a ritual for sending dreams. A cunocaphalos refers to a sacred Egyptian baboon. The instruction reads, Take a sheet of hieratic papyrus, write on it with myrrh ink and baboon's blood, whatever you wish to send. Two additional code words together with the ritual ingredients they encode are attested in an instruction in PGM 13 following the 8th book of Moses. It says, For opening doors, take the navel of a male crocodile, it means pondweed, and the egg of a scarab, 
and a heart of a baboon. It means myrrh. And Egyptian white oil prepared from lilies. Put these into a blue-green fayos vessel. And when you wish to open a door, bring the navel to the door. Here, pondweed and myrrh are encoded. While pondweed is only rarely attested in ancient ritual practice, myrrh is one of the most frequently used ritual ingredients. All of the above given examples demonstrate the use of code words, like the ones given in the list of PGM-12, for specific ritual ingredients within the Greco-Egyptian magical papyri. They were known to and applied by multiple practitioners over a period of several hundred years. Now I wanted to know, are these code words and ritual ingredients attested in manuscripts outside ancient magic as well? The results of this research were amazing. The answer again is yes, both do. The same code words occur in a number of ancient medical books. I will show you examples from the two most famous ones. A book written by the first century physician Dioscorides called About Medical Materials and the herbal of Pseudo-Apuleius, which was probably written in the 4th century. Dioscorides' work impacted Western and Oriental medicine up until less than 200 years ago. So we will start with this one. Who was Dioscorides and what is he famous for? Pedanios Dioscorides was a Greek physician who lived during the 1st century CE in the Roman Empire. He was born in the city of Anazabos in the Roman province Cilicia, which is located in southern Anatolia. Anatolia is also known as Asia Minor. Dioscorides was a leading expert in botany and a pioneer of pharmacology. He wrote the most extensive and most popular ancient books about medicinal substances and their applications. They are best known today under their Latin name, De Materia Medica, and in English, On Medical Material. On Medical Material comprises five volumes and contains very detailed descriptions of plants, animals, and minerals, information about where to find and how to identify them, and comprehensive instructions about how to prepare and apply them in medical contexts. Dioscorides wrote at the beginning of the first volume, for we have learned most of it with the utmost accuracy from our own experience, and some things we have come to know reliably according to the consensus and from research into what is native to the individual. And we will now attempt to apply a different arrangement as well as to describe the types and powers of each remedy. The famous 2nd century physician Galen recognized De Materia Medica as the definite handbook in terms of completeness and thoroughness. De Materia Medica was continuously in use, transmitted, modified and commented on up until the 19th century. Here is a quote from the most comprehensive comparative study on ancient medical books conducted by Paula de Vos in 2010. Thus, while Hippocratic medicine may have provided an early basis for knowledge and use of Materia Medica, it was definitely superseded by the work of Dioscorides in the 1st century AD. The figures indicate that from that point on, the importance of Dioscorides de Materia Medica was unparalleled in providing the basis for the Mediterranean European pharmacopoeia. It is also clear that this influence continued through several major watershed periods. As late as 1865, his Materia Medica remained the core of the Western Pharmacopoeia. Dioscorides de Materia Medica comprises over 900 detailed descriptions of pharmaceuticals and thousands of applications. The vast majority is plant-based, with a smaller number including ingredients of animal and mineral origin. The earliest preserved manuscript of the Materia Medica is an illuminated book dated to the early 6th century with over 400 pictures of plants and animals. 
It was created in the Byzantine Empire's capital Constantinople around the years 512 to 515. Today it is kept at the Austrian National Library in Vienna and it is known as the Vienna Dioscorides. But this famous manuscript does not only comprise the description of pharmaceuticals and their applications. It includes synonyms of these pharmaceuticals used in different languages and by different people. Here is an example from Book 3, Chapter 106. Lily, the royal Crinon. Some call it Crinanthemon, others Calirion. The prophets, blood of Mars. Ostanis calls it crocodile's breath. The Egyptians, Symphairu. Also Tialos. The Romans, Lilium. Rose of Juno. Also Oinomarium. The Syrians, Zaza. The Africans, Abiblaphon. Its blossom is used for wreaths. An anointing oil is prepared from it, which is called Lyrion by some and Zuzinum by others. It softens the tendons and especially hardenings of the uterus. The leaves of the plant help as a poultice for snake bites. Boiled, they are also good for burns. Preserved in vinegar, they are a wound medication. In this example, not only the synonyms used by the Egyptians, the Romans, Syrians and Africans were provided. We also hear about a term used by the magician and alchemist Ostanis and about a term used by the prophets. This term is blood of Mars. If we replace the name of the Roman god of war, Mars, with the name of the Greek god of war, Ares, this would be blood of Ares. And blood of Ares occurs in the list in the Magical Papyrus PGM 12. While Dioscorides mentions it as synonym for lily, in PGM 12 it is the codeword for purslin. Overall, I have found 85 terms ascribed to the prophets for 58 different plants. The vast majority of these synonyms consist of parts of animals, deities or humans, or of their bodily secretions exactly as in the list in PGM-12. There are numerous overlappings between the codewords in PGM-12 and the synonyms in Dioscorides' books, but the assigned ritual ingredients usually differ. One exception is dill. The books of Dioscorides mention three terms of the prophets for dill. Semen of the Cynocephalos, hairs of the Cynocephalos, and semen of Mercury, who is Hermes. PGM 12 is more precise here. The term semen of Hermes is used for dill in general, while the term hairs of the cunocephalos is used specifically for dill seed. Throughout the medical books of Dioscorides, the terms used by the prophets differ from those used in the common Egyptian language. There is more interesting information we can gain from these books and that is that there was more than one code word or synonym in use for a ritual ingredient. This seems to indicate that they were used by different groups of prophets and that there was no overall canon for the application. So, who are the prophets? The identity of the prophets in Dioscorides has been interpreted differently, ranging from Mesopotamian magicians to Jewish and Christian prophets or specifically as Democritus, Ostanus, Pythagoras and Zoroaster. All of those can be refuted easily. There is no evidence for a connection of these specific synonyms with Mesopotamian magicians, nor with Jewish or Christian prophets. And Democritus, Ostanus, Pythagoras and Zoroaster all have their own synonyms, always differing from those synonyms used by the prophets. Then. Who are these prophets? The answer is found in various multilingual inscriptions dating to the Ptolemaic period and later. The best known one is the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone was inscribed with a priestly decree in two languages, Egyptian and Greek. Since it was a priestly decree, it was inscribed not only in the common Egyptian script Demotic, but also in the sacred script of Ptolemaic hieroglyphs. 
This decree was issued in the ancient Egyptian city of Memphis in the year 196 BCE. The inscriptions were the key to deciphering the Egyptian scripts and languages. The Greek section relevant to us reads, Decree The high priests and prophets and those who enter the sanctuary for the robing of the gods and the fan-bearers and the sacred scribes and all the other priests having come together from the temples throughout the land to the king at Memphis for the festival of the assumption of the kingship by Ptolemy. The prophets and the sacred scribes are here both mentioned in contexts of Egyptian temples and ritual practice. In the demotic text of the Rosetta Stone, the term for prophets is chemnecheru. This means literally servants of God. The singular is chemnecher. The chemnecher priest was among the highest ranking priests in ancient Egypt. Prophet, as a translation of the Egyptian priestly title Chemnecha, is also attested in other inscriptions and papyri, dating from the 3rd century BCE and later. Once being aware of this connection, I looked up if the term prophets occurs in the Greek magical papyri. It does multiple times, sometimes even specifically in contexts of divination and burnt offerings. Here are some examples. Burnt offering. Pachrates, the prophet of Heliopolis, revealed it to the emperor Hadrian, revealing the power of his own divine magic. Whenever you seek divinations, be dressed in the garb of a prophet. On the reverse side of the stone, you are to inscribe the name in hieroglyphics, as the prophets pronounce it. A charm for a direct vision. Let the earth be still, let the air be still, let the sea be still, for I am a prophet. All of these sources illustrate that, in the era of the ancient magical papyri, the prophets were high-ranking priests in Egyptian temples, believed to be capable of practicing powerful, even divine magic. In addition, the ascribing of the synonyms in Dioscorides to the prophets supports one of the statements in the introduction in PGM 12, that the Hamenoimata given there were created and used in Egyptian temples. Here is where critical thinking kicks in, because while Dioscorides wrote his books in the later 1st century CE, the earliest preserved copy dates to the 6th century. For over a hundred years, scholars have been, and still are, debating if the synonyms were actually included by Dioscorides himself, or if they were partially or completely added later. However, this question is less relevant for determining what the secret ritual ingredients in PGM-12 are, and what they were used for. Another famous ancient medical book, including code words from the list in PGM-12, is the so-called Herbal of Pseudo-Apuleius. This herbal is a late antique medical text describing the medicinal uses of 131 plants. The descriptions are much less detailed compared to the books of Dioscorides, and the focus is on simple remedies for a non-professional audience. As in Dioscorides' books, the herbal contains synonyms for the herbs in different languages, as well as synonyms assigned to the prophets. I found 54 of these synonyms for 27 different herbs. Here too, the author regularly assigned several synonyms of the prophets to a single herb. A number of these synonyms in Pseudo-Apuleius overlap with those attested in Dioscorides and with those preserved in PGM-12. And we also have an exact parallel of code word and herb in PGM-12 and in the herbal. The blood of Ares is in both manuscripts used for the herb purslane. The herb recommends for burning pain in the stomach, eat the herb purslane with vinegar. Similar but not identical is the use of the term blood of Hephaestus in PGM-12 for wormwood, which is called semen of Hephaestus in the herbal. 
The earliest preserved extant copy of the herbal is dated to the late 6th century. It is kept at the Leiden University Library. The identity of the author has long been debated among scholars. The copies of the herbal name a man called Apuleius, but most scholars think that he was neither the famous Platonist philosopher Apuleius of Madauros, who lived during the 2nd century, nor Apuleius Celsus, a Roman physician of the 1st century. More recently, it has been suggested that the compiler Sextus Placitus Papyrensis was the author of the herbal. He lived in the late 4th or early 5th century. In opposite to Dioscorides, there is no major scholarly discussion about whether the synonyms were originally included by the first compiler of the herbal or if they were added later. By now we have established that the code words and the ritual ingredients of the list in PGM 12 are attested within Greco-Egyptian magic as well as in contemporary medical books outside magic. And we saw identical pairs of code words and ritual ingredients occurring in both sources. These are all manuscripts. Since the introduction to the list in PGM 12 mentions Egyptian priests and seems to refer to a temple context, I wondered, are there any Egyptian temple inscriptions preserved, listing plants and herbs as ritual ingredients, ideally accompanied by recipes of their applications, in temples contemporary to our magical papyrus? And do these ritual ingredients have any connections to the ones in the magical papyrus? So I went through ancient Egyptian temple inscriptions and the astounding answer to all of these questions is yes, in Greco-Egyptian temple laboratories. I was struck when I learned about the existence of these laboratories. Six of them are preserved, some better, some worse and they were all in use during the time when the Greek magical papyri were written. Laboratories are preserved in the temples of Edfu, Komombo, Phile, Athribis, Dendera, and Esna. They were all built within the temple area, but outside its innermost part. The earliest of these laboratories was built in the temple at Edfu by Ptolemy III and decorated during the reign of Ptolemy VI roughly between the 3rd and the 2nd century BCE. The latest laboratory was built in the temple at Esna during the reign of Tiberius or Claudius and decorated by Domitian in the late 1st century CE. These laboratories consist of one to three rooms. Their internal and external walls and doors are decorated with offering scenes and inscriptions. The scenes commonly depict Pharaoh offering all kinds of aromatic substances to various deities, while the inscriptions tell us more about the functions of the laboratories. They were residencies of gods and goddesses, and the priests stored specific aromatic substances in them, which were used as ritual ingredients. But that's not all. The inscriptions also comprise detailed recipes for the preparations of these substances, among them those presented by the king in the depicted scenes. The inscriptions include a recipe for making the nine merchet oils of the opening of the mouth ritual and a recipe for making 100 units of kufi. The most mysterious recipe is the one called Recipe of Mixing the Divine Stone by the Samaj priest, for the divine body of Min Amun and all wooden and stone statues. This is the secret that no one saw or heard, but passed on by the old man to his child. The inscriptions say that composing the recipes was the duty of the god Thoth himself. Many recipes are framed by a short introduction and epilogue referring to actions and rituals for which they were made. And in the Edfu laboratory, a plant catalogue of various types of myrrh trees is preserved. In total, 55 different ingredients are attested in the recipes, the majority being plant-based substances. And over 100 terms are used for plants and parts of plants, raw and cooked oils, ointment and incenses. 
Another impressive number is that over 30 different deities occur in the scenes and inscriptions of the laboratories. Take a look at these examples from the Edfu laboratory. This is the noble laboratory of the falcon, great of strength, Horus the Bahadeti. Hekken oil is in it, at its time an absolute purity for the revealing of the face ritual. Aush incense is in it. The Xiao substances are in it, brought together with their trees, which come forth from the divine body of Horus. This is the laboratory of the majesty of Horachti. His noble sanctuary is provided with its ingredients. His things are collected completely in it. First quality dry Anchumur is in its place in it, provided with all its substances. Auj is in it, Garnu is inside it, and Nanib is mixed in it. First quality tea shepherd's oil, complete in its form, is for providing the eye of Ra with its scent. The noble match ointment for the day of opening of the year is the refined unguent for this god. The king of Upper and Lower Egypt the hair of the manifest gods, son of Ra, beloved of Ta, has come to you, Horus, the Bahadeti, the great god, lord of the sky, Horus, great of triumph, lord of the laboratory, who cooks ointment for the gods and goddesses from the efflux of their bodies. Presenting the Sweat of the God by Pharaoh the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, the heir of the manifest gods, who carries out Ma'at, son of Ra, beloved of Ta, who makes Horus potent with the efflux of his body, who appeases his car with what comes forth from him. I come to you carrying the divine perfume. The perfume fertilizes the bars with its scents. Their Hecken oil makes potent their body and their noses. Utterance I bring to you the Senecha incense which comes forth from your body. These inscriptions tell us that the natural substances and the products made with them were believed to have come forth from the bodies of the gods and their affluxes. Let's take a closer look at the list of trees in the Horus Temple at Edfu which includes more information about their mythological origin. First quality dry Anchumur. It comes into being from the eye of Ra. The gods live on its end. Its name is Aush. Its color is like gold in its great diversity. Dry Anchumur. Its name is Gar Deben. It comes into being from the eye of Osiris. Real Anshu, which comes forth from the left eye, its color is red. Dry Anshumur, its name is Garta. It is Chetshu, its color is red. The best part of it is what is on the underside. It comes forth from the bones of the divine body. Dry Anshumur, in Chesa, its name is Zenon. Its color is like gold. It is soft with its very good quality sap. It comes forth from the backbone of this god. Dry Anshumur. Its name is Ihem. It comes forth from the divine heart. Chao pallets are produced from it. The phoenix is in it as Zenanmur, which comes forth from it. Iham comes into being from the womb of the female falcon. In total, 11 trees of dry anchumur. They are first quality dry anchumur that come forth from the divine body. Concoctions are made from them in the temples of Upper and Lower Egypt. Two examples from the temple laboratory in Athribus enrich the list of mythological origins of ritual ingredients. Anchu trees. Its name is Ibr. Its color is light red. It is soft on the inside. 
Its color is like the sun disk of the season of Peret. It comes forth from the white of the eye of Atum. White wood. It is the eye of Horus. It is like the wood of Jar tree. Specifically, this white wood comes forth from the eye of Horus. This final example from the laboratory in the Hathor temple at Dendra explains that the goddess Hathor herself creates myrrh and ointment from her own body. Utterance by Hathor, the Great One, the Lady of Dendra, Eye of Ra, Lady of the Sky, who creates Anshu myrrh and Ehem ointment from her divine efflux. We can see that the inscriptions in the laboratories illustrate the belief in the divine origin of substances used in various Egyptian temples in ritual contexts. These ritual ingredients were believed to belong to the divine sphere and to create a direct connection between humans and deities. In a recent comprehensive study about the temple laboratories, the author Rika Vardas recognized that in various recipes, quantities and instructions for the preparations of ritual ingredients are actually missing and that multiple calculations are incorrect. Here's her conclusion. The investigation of these recipes showed that displaying them in the laboratories had rather theological than practical reasons. They implied to the fact that laboratories were replicas of large mud brick workshops built outside the temple buildings. These recipes also preserved a secret knowledge and being inscribed in the sacred space of the temple, they got consecrated too. They proved the value of the materials temporarily stored in the laboratory. And finally, the introductions and epilogues of some recipes clearly reflect the function of the room being a link between the external workshops where these aromatic substances were actually made and the places of rituals where the same substances were used. What about the Chemnetcha priest, the prophet? Does he occur in contexts of the laboratories? He does. The Chem Necha priest is mentioned in the laboratories. See this inscription, for example. Spell for entering the residence, carrying oil by the Chem Necha priest. The Wa priest, here a bit is lost, burning Senecha to purify the way before the second quality Anshu. The statues of, the next words are missing, and of the kings of Upper and Lower Egypt proceed to the laboratory. Presenting this Anju to the sanctuary, the Chemnetcha, Wab, and her Hizeshta priests praise His Majesty with this Anju in the laboratory twice and four times, saying praise for the king of Upper and Lower Egypt. This inscription illustrates that the Chemnetcha priest was linked to the temple laboratory to ritual acts, and to the use of ritual ingredients. There is another truly fascinating source about the prophets, the subterranean crypts of the Hathor temple at Dendra. They comprise inscriptions connecting the prophets to masters and keepers of secret knowledge. The place is secret, and no one knows where it is. If they shall search for its entrance, no one will find it, except the prophets of the goddess. Back to the ritual ingredients. What is it with the divine origin of ritual ingredients? Is this a unique attestation in the greco rome laboratories, or is there other testimony? This journey continued to astonish me, and once again, the answer is yes, there is testimony outside the laboratories. In a ritual manual from the Osiris cult, dated to the same period in which the Rosetta Stone was created, the laboratories were built and the earliest preserved magical papyri were written, the Ptolemaic era. This manual is known as Papyrus Salt 825. It comprises a ritual for the preservation of life. The text contains a passage in which the divine creation of various ritual ingredients is described. 
they were created while the gods mourned the murdered Osiris. Listen to what it says. Horus cried. The water fell from his eye to the earth and grew. That is how dry myrrh came into being. Geb was unwell because of it. Blood from his nose dripped to the ground. It sprouted and the pine tree came into being. This is how resin came into being, from his bodily fluids. Shu and Tafnud wept tremendously. The water from their eyes fell to the ground. It sprouted and incense came into being. Re wept again. The water of his eyes fell to the earth. It became a bee. Then the bee built, and its work came into being on the flowers of every field. This is how wax came into being, and how honey came into being from his water. Re was exhausted. His sweat fell to the ground. It sprouted and became flax. This is how linen came into being. Re spat again. The water of his mouth fell to the ground and sprouted, and so papyrus came into being. This sequence from the Osiris cult illustrates once more the idea of a divine origin of ritual ingredients, here from tears, blood, sweat, and saliva. It illustrates the Egyptian belief that every excretion of the gods has creative powers. Let's go back to the beginning, the list in PGM 12, and let's see what we can now say about a potential origin of the code words. The ancient temple laboratories and the ritual preserved in Papyrus Salt 825 illustrate the belief in a divine origin of various ritual ingredients. I think that exactly this belief is reflected in some of the code words in PGM 12, like the semen of Hermes and the blood of Ares. The origin of these code words is rooted in religious beliefs and mythology. This theory so far only comprises those ritual ingredients from PGM 12, whose code words contain the name of a deity. But what about the occurrence of animals in code words? The use of animals in code words can be explained based on Egyptian religious beliefs as well. Ancient Egyptian deities could incarnate as animals. Listen to a quote from Joanna Vilimovska from her paper Sacred Animal Cult Workers in the Ptolemaic Fayum. Animal cults were widely popular during the Greco Roman period. Sacred animals were worshipped in temples as living incarnations of deities, and they frequently took part in religious rituals that were performed in honor of these gods. The sacred animal of Horus was the falcon. The ibis and the baboon were associated with Thoth. Hathor manifested as a cow and Sahmed as a lion. Amun as a ram and a goose. Zobeg as a crocodile. Atum, Month and Ta as a bull. And the primordial god Neheb Kau as a snake. To name just a few examples. These are all animals occurring in the list in PGM 12. But why choosing sacred animals instead of the deities themselves, like the semen of Hermes for Dill and the bone of an ibis for Bakthorn? The answer might be simple. Quantity, variety, and maybe even value or efficacy of ritual ingredients required a wider range of options for code words it would be fascinating to look deeper into this matter. Finally, what about the code words based on human parts? There is one explanation I can currently think of. It concerns the ancient Egyptian ritual practice called the deification of the human limbs. The deification of the human limbs is a ritual for healing the human body and for its protection against various dangers. During the ritual, limbs are assigned to, or equated with, individual deities, thus placed under their protection and united with them. 
The deification of the human limbs ritual was also performed during the mummification to ensure the intactness of the body of the deceased and its protection in the afterlife. Many ancient examples of the deification of limbs are preserved. One of specific interest to us here is an inscription on a small pillar from the so-called Sanatorium of Vendera. The sanatorium was built within the temple walls of the Hathor temple, but outside the main temple. It is debated among scholars if the identification of the ruins as a sanatorium is actually correct. Egyptian temples were places of medical advice and healing, but the potential sanatorium in the Hathor temple at Dendera would be the only one of its kind within a temple area preserved and known to us today. The inscription on the pillar is dated between the 2nd century BCE and the 1st century CE. Here are some telling quotes from it. Your head is the head of Atum. Your eyes are Hormerti. Your nose is Horus. Your lips are Ptah. Your tongue is Thoth. Your heart is Reharachte. Your chest is Nate. Your backbone is gap. Your testicles are the seeds of the martyr plant. All of the human parts are ascribed to and identified with a deity. That's the core objective of this ritual. But the final part is identified with a plant, the martyr plant. This only makes sense when the plant was identified with a deity itself. I wonder if the code words comprising parts and afflixes of the human body were based on the same idea which was underlying the ritual of the deification of limbs. This would attest to a divine origin, or at least a divine power, of the ritual ingredients they encode. With all this in mind, let's finally go back to the beginning, to the list in PGM 12, and to its introduction. Here it is again. Because of the interference of the many, they inscribed the herbs and that other which they had used on statues of the gods, so that they interfere with nothing, being incautious, because of the ongoing failures. But we fetch the solutions out of the many copies, together with all the encryptions. This introduction does not only explain why the priests decided to create and use code words, that is, to protect non-experts from applying the ritual ingredients incorrectly. It also explains how they did it. But the relevant part has been puzzling scholars for over a century, and still does. It has been translated as follows so far. Because of the intermeddling of the masses, they inscribed the herbs and that other which they had used on statues of the gods. That doesn't make much sense, and there is no archaeological record of temple statues inscribed with ritual ingredients or their code words. Let's take a closer look at the original Greek text. The term translated as statues is eidolon, and eidolon comprises various meanings. An image in the mind, an idea, an actual image, a likeness. In later times it was also used for an image of a god or an idol. If we now take a look at the Greek term that has been translated as inscribed so far, this term is epigrapho. While it is commonly translated as to inscribe in the Greek magical papyri, it also means to ascribe and to attribute. Based on these new translations, I wonder if the sacred priests did not inscribe the names of the herbs and other things which they employed on the statues of the gods, but rather they ascribed them to the ideas about the gods or to the likenesses of the gods in terms of 
They ascribe the ritual ingredients to a religious mythological background and divine origin. Looking at all of the ancient sources we have seen on this journey, here is what I think about the code words and the secret ritual ingredients in the magical papyri. The code words in the list in PGM 12 are rooted in ancient Egyptian religion and the belief in the divine origin of ritual ingredients. Ancient Egyptian mythology provided the fundament for those code words referencing deities. And the fact that Egyptian deities could manifest in the shape of animals provided the fundament for the animal-based code words. The divine power of ritual ingredients encoded with parts and bodily fluids of humans is referenced or maybe even established in context of the belief in the deification of the limbs. Applying not only deity and divine animal-based code words, but in addition human-based code words, would have increased the number of ritual ingredients which could have been encoded. This would have enabled priests to include new ingredients which entered Egyptian magical, medical and ritual practice more recently, for example during the Ptolemaic period, or which were introduced by foreign cultures. The priests decided to apply code words for ritual ingredients in order to prevent harm caused by non-experts using these ritual ingredients incorrectly. So far we know that encoded ritual ingredients were used in ritual practice for incensing, oils and ointments and as burnt offerings, in medical contexts for healing numerous different diseases and in magical practice, especially in contexts of divination, meaning in direct interactions with deities. We also know that some of the ritual ingredients were poisonous. Based on this knowledge, the decision of the priests to encode their ritual ingredients seems easily comprehensible. Incorrectly applied intoxicants, medical materials, and ingredients attracting higher powers can certainly cause serious harm. A question that currently remains open is how non-experts could have gotten access to the priestly knowledge. A potential answer is provided by Rika Veda's conclusion that laboratories were replicas of large mud brick workshops built outside the temple buildings. The mud brick workshops then, with recipes and ingredients being kept there, could have been accessible to a broader audience or even the public in general. The same could have been the case for the potential sanatorium in the Dendra temple. Another potential path to look at is the priests themselves, since it was common in Egyptian temples that priests worked in part-time, spending only a limited period of time over the year at the temple. This way, knowledge could have left the temple as well. One last thing, the introduction to the list in PGM 12 claims to comprise the Hamenoimata and their translations. And that is true too. The code words refer to Greek deities like Helios, Hermes and Hephaestus. So the list does actually comprise a translation of the Egyptian Hamenoimata, the priestly interpretations of the origin of ritual ingredients. The Egyptian sun god Ra, for example, is identified with Helios, Thoth with Hermes, and Ta with Hephaestus. While this video is coming to an end, the journey is moving on. Many of the secret ritual ingredients can be identified, and I want to continue to research their use in Egyptian temples, their medical properties, and their applications in ancient magic. What we have seen is that it is worth starting research from a neutral perspective. Because only if we examine information and do not reject it from the outset as false and worthless, we will be able to find answers that grant us a deeper insight into ancient beliefs. Thank you for watching my video. 
If you want to read more about the archaeology of ancient magic, take a look at my blog and my social media channels. You can find my monthly lectures, ask me questions, and support my research on patreon.com under my handle Ancient Magic. Looking forward to meeting you there.